as I said before, uh, in my 35 years in the ministry, 95% of all that I know has been passed on to me through teaching. And only 5%, I should say, if it's that much, is something that I've gotten uh, through my own studies. And uh, of course, as you can look at those percentages, that if I had to survive on the 5%, uh, it wouldn't be very good, would it? That means I'd have a 95% chance of not making it. But if I had done my own studies, then uh, I would have a 95% chance, but that's still not good enough either. It should be 100%. And so the information that I have that, um, that I'm teaching and passed on uh, came from those that handed it down to me. Now, I'm going to teach a Bible class on the succession of truth and how truth is supposed to be handed down. And I've pretty much got all my scriptures together. It probably will be the next Bible class, and we will talk a little bit about it. Uh, we go out of state to teach that it's important to uh, pass down the things of God that um, he has given and it's very important for that, uh, even in our homes with our children. The parents, the mother, the father, they pass things down to their children. And they pass it down to their children in hopes that their children would not have to suffer the same mistakes, go through the same things that they went through, but that it would spare them and give them a little jump head start on life. Now, I didn't have a father handed things down to me. Uh, my father was not around uh, too much. My mother left my father when uh, I was eight years old, and she pretty much raised me uh, from the time I was eight well, uh, from when, my, when she separated from my father until I left home at 18. And so there were things that I did not get passed on to me from my father, uh, but I did get some things passed on to me from my mother. So this is what uh, we do. We try to hand things down, hand things down uh, to our children. And uh, the Bible says a wise man will hear instruction. But a lot of the problems that we have with young people today is that they're not taking heed to the good counsel that's been handed down to them. And then again, too, some of them are not getting any counsel handed down to them because their parents, their Mother and father did not get anything handed down to them. But God uh, instructed the, um, the children of Israel uh, through Moses how his word and his truth and his actions uh, and his ways are to be passed down to the children. The greatest successor, succession of truth handed down was our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And even God exemplified handing down his truth by giving it to Adam. He told Adam, out of every tree of the garden you may free to eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. And of course, because Adam did not take heed to that truth as he should have, society in this world is in the condition uh, that it is in now. So God tried to hand it down to the first man, uh, Adam, who failed him, uh, and then God, uh, based on Adam's repentance, uh, restored him, but the penalty of sin was still in force. And so the Bible says that the Lord has had prophets since the world began. Now, it didn't say since the earth began, but since the world began. And where did the world begin? Adam. Adam was the beginning of the world. And so if God has had prophets, according to Acts chapter 7, I believe it is, if he has had prophets since the world began, and the world began in Adam, and that meant that the Adam was the first prophet. And by him being a prophet, the fact that he was a prophet indicates that he instructed his sons. And according to history, Adam and Eve had more than three children. Uh, the Bible says that Adam and Eve begat sons and daughters. And so uh, only three of them are mentioned by name, Cain, Abel, and Seth. The Bible says that they had sons and daughters. According to history, uh, they supposedly had had a total of 60 children. 
33 sons and 27 daughters. And so I said, well, how could that be, uh, Pastor? Well, you can't think of terms of today because the world and society is not nearly uh, the way that it was back then. Back then, you didn't have cancer. Back then, you didn't have a lot of the diseases uh, that you have today because the diseases that we have today have all been brought about because of man's uh, behavior. And, and some of the things that go on today uh, was not in the civilization uh, at the start then because the civilization was just starting. So um, they had a total of 60 children according to uh, history. Uh, we do know the Bible says that we got sons and daughters. So Adam and Eve had some, not only sons, but they had some daughters. And Adam passed down, being the first prophet, passed on to his children uh, the things of God. All the way down to the 10th generation. And when you get to the 10th generation, there was a man that found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What was his name? Noah. Noah was the 10th generation of Adam. And Noah knew the things of God simply because of the fact that it had been handed down um, from generation to generation. Now, um, I don't have uh, those notes here, but I did a study to show how a lot of the patriarchs' uh, lives overlapped from each other. And if my memory serves me correct, I think Noah might have died something like 50 years uh, before Abraham was born. And so I did a study as to how long these fathers lived and um, how much their lives overlapped the other patriarchs' lives, men of God, and there's something to see, and you can actually see how the truth of God and the knowledge of God uh, could actually have been handed down. Because many of these individuals' lives overlapped uh, each other. You say amen? And we'll, we'll, we'll look at that. I have all the material, just a matter of formatting it into a Bible study and present it to you. But um, be that as it may, our subject is, and God said, let us make man. So let us read verse 26 again in Genesis chapter 1, and verse number 26, and do a brief recap. And we're going to bring this subject to a conclusion tonight. All right, Genesis chapter 1. Verse number 26, let's read. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that what? Creepeth upon the earth. Now, God makes this statement in the sixth day. There are seven days in God's created week. Is that right? And in the sixth day, the sixth day began with God made who? Man. Made man first, then the animals. And verse 24 is the beginning of the sixth day, because verse 23 says that the evening and the morning were the fifth day, which means that verse 23 concludes the fifth day of God's created week. And so in verse 24 begins the sixth day. It begins the sixth day by saying, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature. Again, living creature comes from the Hebrew word nephesh, which means a living soul. And we know that animals do not have souls. The only creature out of all of God's creation that has a soul, which is the eternal part of man, is man himself. So we have the beginning of the sixth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature. Keep in mind, as we told you before, the first 34 verses of the Bible, which is Genesis chapter 1, and the first three verses of chapter 2, is not what God did, but what He planned to do. We are reading God's plan in His foreknowledge. This is what He is planning to do. And He planned out His creation. He thought out His 50,000 year plan, which includes these seven days of one of these days are 50,000 years long, uh, 7,000 years long, excuse me. Each day is 7,000 years long. God's plan of time is 50,000 years. And it is spelled out in a period of seven
seven days, known as the seven days of God's creative week. Now, in him, in his mind, because what we are reading is before the foundation of the world. We are reading what God plans to do. Now, five days have already passed. And part of the sixth day has already passed. And so now we are almost 6,000 years into the sixth day. <coughs> Even scientists concur with the fact that modern man, that's the term that they use, modern man, has been on the earth for some six, almost 6,000 years, which in fact coincides with the Bible. Now, we're not talking about Neanderthal man and the caveman, all these other kinds of things that they have made up that are not in the Bible. Can you say amen? You know, but the term that they use is modern man, the way that we know man is today. Well, the way man we know of as today has always been, but they just don't know that. So it's been 6,000 years from the time that God began the sixth day by saying, let the earth break forth the even creature. Now, he is created in the first 34 verses of the Bible. He's created. He's causing to exist in his mind. He hasn't done anything yet. It's spoken of as if he has done it already because the Bible says God called those things that be not as what? They were. He says, before they bring forth, I speak of them. Think of the thing he said in the book of Isaiah. He declared the end from the beginning. God has already determined what the end is going to be from the beginning. And so we are in his mind, before the foundation of the world, in these first 34 verses of the Bible. This is God's 50,000 year plan of time. And he creates everything plans out what he is going to do in each of these days. And when he gets down to the sixth day, in his mind, in eternity at this time, because he is in eternity, planning out what he's going to do when he begins time. He begins the sixth day by saying, let the earth bring forth the what? Living creature. That's why in Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7, you get the beginning of the sixth day. It begins with God forming man out of the dust of the ground and breathing into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a what? Living. So that's the beginning of the sixth day. That's the beginning of God executing what he had planned in the first chapter in verse 24. Is now executed in the second chapter, verse number seven. That's the beginning of the sixth day. Now, the sixth day was not just to include God forming man on the dust of the ground or making the animals from the dust of the ground, because as we go down a little further in his mind, in his plan, in verse 24. And 25, God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, cattle, uh, after their kind, everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. This is all in one day, the sixth day. Now, in verse 26, we get to the middle of the sixth day. We have something a little different. And God said, Let us make man in our image of what? After our likeness. Now, that clause. That clause is different from verse 24. It's different from Genesis 2 and 7. It's not dealing with God forming man of the dust of the ground because in his plan, that is done in verse 24. But when he says, and God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. This is in the middle of the sixth day now. The beginning of the sixth day is in verse 24. Middle of the sixth day is in verse 26. And this has reference to God speaking to the church, pronouncing that he was going to use the church to make man in his image and after his likeness. 
Now, why would God have to make man over again in verse 26? Because he knew in the beginning, up until a certain time, that man that he had made in his image initially, and made him holy, and made him perfect, that corruption was going to set in. He already knew. So in his plan in eternity, for the foundation of the world, he had planned out to make man, make the animals. He had planned out to create man, which he did, but he knew that man was going to mess up. And so he had also in his plan to make man over again in his image and after his what? Likeness. And the beginning of that is the Great Commission when he told the apostles, Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of what? The Holy Ghost. What is he saying? Now we begin the process of making man in my image, in our image, after our likeness. Because he's talking to someone that has the same image and the same likeness that he had. God talked to his church before the foundation of the world concerning making sons of God into that same image that was to come at that time, which was Jesus Christ. He talked to the church before the foundation of the world. Yes, he chose us, Paul said, in him before the foundation of the world. The Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. The Lamb's book of life, the names were written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world because of God's entire plan was done and finished before the what? The foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world. And so this is why a lot of people stumble at Genesis 126. They think it's the same thing as verse 24, or they don't even understand verse 24, because they think that in verse 24 when it says, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature, they think that's an animal. But it's not an animal, that's the human animal. That's man. But they think Genesis 126 is... Genesis 2 and 7, and God formed man out of the ground. Oh no, that happened at the beginning of the sixth day. We're in verse 26. This is in the middle of the sixth day. And Jesus Christ came in the middle of the sixth day. Why? Because it was in God's plan before the foundation of the world that he was going to make man in his image and after his likeness and that he was going to use the church to accomplish his goal. Why? Because God wanted a bride. And that bride will be those that will make the rapture. Can we say amen? amen. Alright, now the rest of verse 26 goes back to what man was going to be doing in the beginning of the sixth day. But the first clause is dealing with something completely different. And that's how the Bible is written. The Bible's not written just like any other kind of book, like the People magazine or the Newsweek magazine or the Bay City Times, which is, uh, they can't even get that paper away anymore. <laughs> or your James Patterson novels. Can we say amen? You know, the Bible don't read like that. The Bible is here a little and there a little. In the Bible, you can have a verse that has nothing to do with the content of the subject that the verse is in. That's how a prophecy works. And in this text, in verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, it's completely different from the rest of the verse, completely different from verse 24, because that's how the Bible's written. It's written to deceive the natural man. Why? Because it's not given to him to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. It's given to the children of God. He has hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them unto who? Babes. That's why people, when they read it, they say, oh, he's talking to the Trinity. Or oh, he's talking to the devil. Or oh, he's talking to the angels. The devil does not cooperate with God to make the church into his image. Can we say amen? He's too busy trying to destroy the church. The angels have nothing to do with trying to make the church into God's image. Because angels don't know anything about being saved and being lost. They, have, they know nothing about it. And of course, there is no trinity. Can we say amen? 
Mr. Shaw about the movie Trinity. I know there was a Western back in 1972 called They Called Me Trinity. Remember that show? Well, that's a pretty funny Western you don't see it. They Called Me Trinity. Then the next movie they came out with, uh, I said Trinity is my name. And then they came up with a third one, and you know how it is when they come up with sequels, they're like, okay, nothing is as good as the first one. Is that right? <laughs> but be that as a man, he's talking to those he chose in him before the foundation of the world. The church. God determined before the foundation of the world that he was going to use the church that he had established in the earth to make us into that perfect image of his perfect son. What's his name? Jesus. And he's using the church to do it. All right? But that's just a brief recap. Let's go to... Um, See, we already covered uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 through 17. I think we did cover that. That's dealing with defiling the church of God. The church of God can be defiled through false teaching. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 through 17 deals with. Because remember we talked about Paul saying that other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is who? Jesus Christ. Uh, but let every man take heed how he builds upon that foundation. Any man build upon that foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stone. Every man's work shall be tried by fire, and the fire shall reveal what sort of work that it is. Now, he was not talking about actual gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hand, stone. He's dealing with the quality of one's workmanship. So as the pastor is building, God using the church to build his church with the souls of men through the ministry that is established, quality of the workmanship of the pastor should be of gold, silver, and precious stones. So that when the fiery trial comes, the test will come, because churches go through trials, the work won't be destroyed. But if he is building with the quality of wood, hay, and stubble, those are very combustible materials that will easily do what? Burn up. Burn up. Now, if the trial comes and destroys his church, because the quality of his workmanship was of the quality of wood, hay, and stubble, that doesn't mean that the past is going to be lost, but he can still be saved. He's going to lose his reward, but he can be saved. But if he's going to be saved, he's going to be saved through the trials and tests that he goes through. Let me say amen. Then he talks about defiling the temple of God, defiling the church of God. This scripture deals with the church, the entire church of God as a temple. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we are individual temples. In, uh, in uh, uh, the scripture that we're talking about here, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the church of God is a temple. So we are individual temples. As a whole, we are the temple. Individually, we are sons of God. Collectively, as a whole, we are the son of God. Right? And so, um, the temple of God, the church of God, can be defiled through false teaching. And he said, he that defiles the church of God, him shall God what? Destroy. Remember we read that last week? Amen. We're not going to go back over it because we want to finish this tonight. So, we don't want God's church to be defiled through false teaching. Even though there are some out there teaching false doctrine, and defiling the church, corrupting the church through their false teaching, teaching once saved, always saved, or teaching you don't have to be baptized in Jesus' name in order to be saved, teaching that baptism in Jesus' name is just tradition, you don't have to be baptized, all these type of things, these things are defiling God's church. And the Bible says, he that defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. All right? Well, let's look at that a little further. Let's go to James chapter 5. And verse number 20. Well, I said verse 20, but we might start uh, at verse 19. James chapter 
chapter 5 and verse number 19. See, the truth is important. You know why it's so important? It's because God is building his church with the truth. And false doctrine, false teaching is very damaging. James chapter 5, and let's read verse number 19. All right, we have it, let's read. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one were converted. So now he says, brothers, so he's dealing with someone that is in the church. Someone that's saved. Brother, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him. The individual has erred from the truth, they have strayed from the truth, and one comes and converts them back into the truth. Let's read verse 20. Let him know that he which converted the sinner, now hold it, he is a what? Sinner. If he errs from the truth, that means he's gone into falsehood and he is considered, according to the scripture, a what? Sinner. Now, if he gets converted, let him know that he which converted the sinner from the what? Error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide what? False teaching is dead. And it is destroying many people today because the order of our day is deception, false doctrine. People will sit up and curse and swear and commit all kinds of sins and at the same breath tell you how saved they are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they bring a whole new meaning to hypocrisy. It's as though that sin is tolerable today. They do not want to be corrected. They do not want you to teach against sin. Because they say, if you do that, you're judging. You're not supposed to judge anybody. That's not what the Bible said. It says, judge not that you be not judged. Why should I judge not that I be not judged? Because whatever judgment you give is going to come back to you if you're guilty. And then he says, why then are you trying to cast the moat out of your brother's eye when there's a beam in your own eye? Then Jesus says, thou hypocrite. So what is the text saying? Don't be judging nobody when you're guilty of the same thing. And don't want to be judged. He's not saying you cannot judge because the Bible says in 1 Peter 4, 17, that judgment begins at the what? House of God. Then he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you know you're not that the saints shall what? Judge the world? What are you talking about? You just don't want to be correct. Not you. For those I'm talking to. Can we say Amen. You just don't want to be told that you're wrong. You just don't want to be told that follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. You don't want to be told that the wages of sin is death. Now that's a judgment right there. But the gift of God is what? Eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. You just don't want to be taught that you have to repent. John the Baptist says the axe is laid at the root of the tree. You need to repent. Turn from your wicked ways. As the prophet spoke in behalf of the Lord in Isaiah 55, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his what? Way. And the unrighteous man is what? Thoughts. So according to you, I'm not supposed to call nobody wicked. I'm not supposed to call nobody unrighteous. Well, if we can't do that, then how do we know what righteousness is and what wickedness is? We know what it is according to what God says it is. You have to call a spade a spade. Can we say amen? amen? And you can't sit up there and say you're not supposed to judge. Drive 100 miles down Madison and get taken to jail and go in and tell the judge that. You can't judge me because the Bible says judge not that you be not judged. <laughs> Doesn't that sound ridiculous? If you get in Judge Kelly's court, He's going to convict you of that and try to find some other stuff on you. Because, <laughs> of course, now I'm in a big city. Uh, well, we don't even talk about that. But anyway, uh, that's ridiculous. So when people say, oh, you're judging me, it's an attitude that they don't want to be correct. They don't want to be told 
that they're wrong. And that's why we have prisons, 41,000 inmates in 22 prisons, because somebody don't want nobody telling them what to do. Well, somebody can tell you what to do now. Oh, you are not going to get through this life without somebody telling you what to do. It's impossible. You say amen? It's impossible. Because when you go to Walmart, they're going to say, put your stuff up here. Don't tell me what to do. That's $45.95. Don't tell me how much I got to pay. And you walk out there with that stuff and you want to. And there are some guys that are just, ooh, we got an opportunity. And they'll come and club you back into the store. You hear what I'm saying? Somebody, somewhere, sometime is going to tell you what? What to do. The cable company is going to tell you what to do. Your bill is $99 and don't pay it. You say, man, you won't be watching, be able to watch your show Empire. Now, I don't watch Empire. But some folks are going, no, you don't got on Empire. Okay, we'll get off of that. <laughs> But well, somebody is going to tell you what, what to do. I mean, I was talking to a convict one time, and I said, well, why are you in prison? He said, because I refuse to let anybody tell me what to do. I'm my own boss. I don't follow man. I said, yes, you do. He said, no, I don't. I said, you said you don't follow man, but you tell your own self what to do. He said, that's right. I said, well, you still follow the man. So what are you, a Martian? You say, you say you don't recognize nobody's authority but your own. So you still recognize the authority. It might be yours, it might be corrupt, but you still obey some authority. I said, Doc, the bottom line is that you're just full of the devil. And you're just doing what the devil tells you to do. That's the bottom line. Well, he didn't like that. But it's the truth. Somebody is going to tell you what don't tell me what to do, and well, then you're not going to get anywhere in life. Because somebody's going to tell you what to do. And I know one person that's going to tell you what to do, and that's you. You say, man, you are going to tell you, get on up from there, laying in the bed, get up. All right, let me get on up. You are going to tell you what? So you can't get away from it. Can we say amen? Whether it's your mama or your daddy or your uncle or whatever, or whether it's you. I don't tell myself what to do, Pastor. Yes, you do. Because we talk to ourselves all the time. I need to stop eating all that. Let me stop. I ain't got no business eating that. No, we do it. So somebody is going to tell you what to do, even if it's you, because you are somebody. Hallelujah! <laughs> All right, anyway. Well, <laughs> shall save a soul from death and shall hide a what? A multitude of sin. Going off into false doctrine after hearing the truth. If one converts him, he that converted, converted the sinner from the air of his way shall save a soul from death. Because if they do not recover a false doctrine, what's going to happen to them? They're going to die in their sins. Well, let's go to Hebrews chapter 6. And verse number 1 through 6. Hebrews chapter 6. And I can tell the fall is here. Because my allergies are coming up my eyes are water. So it's coming. Lord have mercy. Hebrews chapter 6. Now of course it ties into chapter 5. And so we're not going to go off into that. So we're operating in the middle of the thought. Well, let's read it. Therefore, y'all there? Hebrews 6, verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into what? Now, you can't go on to perfection until you, first of all, leave the principles. You can't leave the principles unless you have grasped them and know them and have them acted where? I'm repeating some of us. Somebody already quoted me. Well, I said, you say amen? Once you understand them and are living them, then you can progress to go on unto perfection. You'd be surprised when the saints don't know.
the six principles of the doctrine of Christ, which is called the note of God's Word. And don't be surprised about that because there's some pastors that don't know. Should I go a little further? Well, don't be surprised about pastors that don't know about the six principles because there's some suffocate bishops that don't know. And guess what? Don't be surprised about that because there's some bishops that don't know the six principles of the doctrine of Christ. Well, pastor, how can they go on to perfection? You can. You can say amen. <laughs> when the time you ought to be teachers, you need to be taught what? All over again. So, if God has blessed you to understand them and know them and learn them and they've taught them, then you can leave them and go on into what? Perfection. Let's read. Yeah. Not laying again the what? Foundation. The foundation. The six principles of the doctrine of Christ is the foundation that the church is built upon. The church is built upon a set of six principles. This is the foundation. Somebody said, well, I thought Jesus Christ was the foundation. He is the foundation. The foundation is what Jesus Christ taught. Can <laughs> we say amen? And these six principles are not only in the New Testament, they are also where? I wonder if I gave y'all the testament tonight. How many of y'all have passed that? It's been a long time, hasn't it? And we need to go back into that. That was a lot of fun, wasn't it? I enjoyed it. <laughs> yes, what a time that was, wasn't it? Was you here, brother? You were here? Were you here? You all were serious, too. Some folks said, can we use our Bible? They ain't even here no more. They can say, man. But the ones that said, I ain't using my Bible, you all are still here. Amen. I believe. I remember it says correct. It's one person comes to mind. Oh, yeah. And I think, I think Amber got 100%. I think it's Gigi got 100%. Is that true? No, she, I think she was debating with me here in Philip because I marked something wrong on there. First time I got 100 You got something to <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun, wasn't it? Six principles. And I remember um, Evangelist Shiver said that because she took that test, she was able to pass and get her license for no additional counsel. You know, well, that was wonderful. The foundation is set as a set of six principles. Let's read them. Um, repentance from dead works, that's the first one. Faith toward God, that's number two. Of the doctrine of baptism, that's number three. And of laying on the hands, number four. And of resurrection of the dead, number five. And what? Eternal judgment. And this will we do in what? Now that means that we will uh, leave them if God blesses us and helps us. We will leave these principles and go on into perfection. That God can uh, teach us and we can assimilate some of the deeper things of the Bible because we have grasped and understand the basic, simple fundamentals of the apostolic doctrine, which is a set of six principles. The basic, simple fundamentals of the apostolic doctrine is the foundation, a set of six principles, penance for dead works, faith for God, doctrine of baptisms, laying on the hands, resurrection of the dead, Eternal judgment. All of these principles are throughout the Bible. They're just not only in the New Testament, they also are in the Old Testament. And I think we covered some of those things before. Now, let's look at verse number four. All right, let's read. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. Enlightened to what? Enlightened to the six principles of the doctrine of Christ, which is the foundation that the church is built upon. All right? It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the what? Heavenly gift and were made partakers of what? The Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away. Now, the falling away. Falling away from what? Falling away from the teachings of the six principles of the doctrine of Christ. Falling away from the foundation.
foundation. And the houses that they bought fell away. Well, they are not teaching it. They're teaching something contrary. Anytime a person teaches contrary to foundational truth, they have fallen away. Fallen away from God. That's what the Bible says. And have tasted the good part. Verse 6, they shall fall away to renew them again unto what? Repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to what? See, we thought that it had to do with somebody who backslides. Oh no, this happens when they fall away from truth. That's why the Bible, James, says that they are a sinner. That's why Paul says uh, they are defiling the temple of God and God's going to destroy them. Did you know that Jim Jones was baptized in his name from the Holy Ghost because apostolic at one time? Fell away. What happened to him? Where is he at now? He's gone. Is that right? And almost a thousand people that followed him. And others that have defected from the faith. And God has cut them off. As the Bible says, it was because they were defied the church of God. Well, if they shall fall away. Fall away from what? Fall away from the foundation. What is the foundation? The set of six principles. Falling away from repentance from dead works, faith toward God, doctrine of baptisms, laying on the hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Did you know we had a bishop at one time that taught that there was no such thing as a rapture, no such thing as a tribulation period, no such thing as a millennial reign, no such thing as a heaven, new heaven and new earth? What happened to him? He what? fell away. And when for the time he ought to be able to teach somebody that, he needed to be taught what? We have a whole lot of folk that need to be taught all over again. They think that faith is you speaking it out into the air and then it's going to happen. That you can call those things that be not as though they were. What happened? They've fallen away. They need to be taught all over again what faith toward God is. Can we say amen? It's not you speaking something out into the air and happening. Faith is God's word. Believe. But see, they teach now, you know, these word of faith churches. And we have them around here, they call, you know, the word of faith churches. That phrase, word of faith, is not talking about this word. Oh no. It's talking about their words. Because I have the whole word of faith doctrine down since my office. It was brought about by um, Kenneth Hagin, I believe it was. Kenneth Hagin. Uh, and Kenneth Hagin's teachings is followed by Joyce Myers, Creflo Dowling, Fred Price, John Hagin, a lot of the big time preachers you see on television have tutored under the teaching of Kenny Hagin. And that's why if you listen to all of them, they all teach and say the same thing because they tutored under the teachings of Kenny Hagin, who was the one that brought about the teachings of Word of Faith, that you are supposed to have faith in your word, that you should have a word of faith, and that you should have faith in your words. Have faith in your faith to produce action. That God has faith in his words, and because he has faith in his faith, or faith in his words, he can make things happen. He can speak things out into the atmosphere, and it would happen. And so you should have the word of faith. You should have faith in your words to do the same thing. Because if God can do it, then you can do it. That's a lot from the pit. Because I can say million dollars. I don't see it nowhere. Can we say amen? That's a lie from the devil. You don't have faith in your faith. You have faith toward God. You can speak those things that be not as though they were because you're not God. God took a fist 
and made the universe. You can't take a fist full of anything, and some of us can't even take a fist full of chicken and cook anything. I'm quite sure some of y'all can. Can we say amen? Can you make chicken catch a tory? Is that what is that? Well, look it up. Lamb in the glass. Fishy swamp. I said, what in the world is that? I don't remember. It just sounds good. But what I am saying is that we can't take nothing and make something. God took nothing and what? Made everything. We can't do that. Because there's only one God. Can you say amen? Now you can speak some things and make it happen. I'm going to get on about this chair. And then you get on about the chair. Oh, I'm going to fix me some lunch. And you go in and what? Fix some lunch. Oh, I'm going to work tonight. And you get up and what? Go to work. But if God says you ain't going nowhere, you won't be able to get up out the chair. You can say amen. We all say, if the Lord will, I'm going to do this and do that. Can we say amen? I had one say one time, I said, you come to church tomorrow, they said, it's the Lord's will. I said, it's his will, honey, for you to come to church. <laughs> Y'all didn't get that, did you? I had a saint say, well, I'll be in church tomorrow, it's the Lord's will. Yes, the Lord is willing for you to be in church. <laughs> so, um, falling away from the teaching, and it is very damaging because God is trying to make man in his image and after his what? Likeness. He's using the church to do it. But the devil's come in and corrupted. And trying to take the very entity that God is using to make man over again and trying to use it to destroy man. Remember, Jesus said, Upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not what? Yeah. Well, yes, but they're trying. They're trying. Well. Let us now go to Matthew chapter 3. We're almost finished here. We got one, two, three, four, five, six scriptures that we've done. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. Matthew 3, and verse 11 to 12. He is making us in his image after his likeness. And he's doing it through the ministry that he has established on the earth which is the church. All right. Matthew 3, verse 11 to 12. The words of John the Baptist. Let's read. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. Now John came baptized. His ministry was to baptize the Messiah and make him manifest to Israel, but he didn't know who the Messiah was. So he just baptized him by that came. And he preached repentance. All right. He said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear or carry, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with what? Fire. Now that fire has to do with the test and trial. Amen. You know, that doesn't, you know, people stand up, we used to hear people all the time, when I was talking about, thank God, I've been baptized with the Holy Ghost and that with fire. And they just start shouting around and jumping around making a whole bunch of noise. That's not what he's talking about. Another thing that people generally say that you don't hear much of it, but I used to hear it quite a bit. I thank the Lord that I'm saved, sanctified, and clothed in my right mind. I'm glad you are clothed in your right mind. Why do they say that? Because of the man that had the demons cast out of him from Gadara, when Jesus cast the devil out of him, the Bible says he was delivered clothed and in his what? Right mind. Why? Because he was running around naked. So sometimes I kind of tickle about that when saints say, I'll say, sanctify and clothed in my right mind. Well, yes, we can see that you are clothed. Can we say amen? amen. But whether you are in your right mind, it remains to be seen. <laughs> Hopefully you are. You know, but that's where that came from. But anyway, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. After the word fire, you have a what? What is that there? What are those two periods? That's a colon, which means that there's an explanation to follow instead of the previous state. What is the fire? He says, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and 
gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with what? So the fire is the purging of his floor. Now, the floor he's talking about is the threshing floor, which was a hard surface, packed down hard. And this is where they thresh wheat. The farmer would go out and bring the wheat in and put it on that threshing floor. There's two ways that he thresh it. When we talk about threshing. What is threshing? It's separating the chaff from the wheat. It's knocking out the kernels. And what he would do, he could take a flail and he could beat on that threshing floor, beat on that grain to separate the chaff from the wheat. Now the chaff and the wheat look very similar, but the chaff was a lot lighter than the wheat. Or he could take an ox and have that oxen trample over all that wheat separate chaff from the wheat and then he will take a winnowing shovel um, and dip that a winnower in there and dip that which is like a long pitchfork shovel like and throw it up in the air and the wind or the fan that he would have will blow the chaff out of the way and the wheat will fall back on the ground. So the fire which is the test of the trials is symbolic of us being on his threshing floor. And God is separating the chaff from the wheat, separating his children from those that are not his children. Working out of us things that are not like him, separating the chaff from the wheat. And this is what he does to the church, because he's trying to make us in his image and what? say amen, that we will be like Jesus. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 47 to 49. We're almost finished for tonight. 1 Corinthians 15, 47 to 49. All right. There's two verses there.
perfect image of Christ, who is our Heavenly Father, so that when we get our heavenly bodies, we won't fit right. Can we say amen? That's why the trials come. That's why the instructions come. That's why the chastisement comes. Because God is shaping us, molding us into the perfect character of Jesus Christ. So that when the rapture takes place, we will be ready and we will fit our glorified body. God forbid that I don't fit when the rapture takes place. Can we say amen? Now I bought me a new suit today. And I'm happy because it's a size 48. And I can fit. I fit a 48. I was a 54. But when I was a 54, I couldn't fit in that 48. Can we say amen? I could barely get my arm in it. But I fit now because I had to do some work. Well, I want to fit in that heavenly suit. Can we say amen? amen? And you want to fit in that heavenly suit. So we got to let God work on us. We got to endure hardness as a good soldier in who? Christ Jesus. We got to come to God when you fall into what? Because God is shaping you up to fit your heavenly suit. Isn't that something? Yeah. Oh, I feel better already. Yeah. I'm tired, I came in, but I'm feeling pretty good because I got a new suit coming. Yeah. Not the kind that uh, is going to wear out and going to clean it all the time. But a glorified body. You know, I was teaching on the resurrection one time many years ago, and uh, one thing about Daniel, my son, he always had questions about the glorified body because his body could not produce cells, normal cells that carry hemoglobin oxygen through his blood. His body produced sickle cells that did not have no oxygen. And wherever there was blood, those cells could clog up and eventually kill him. So he was looking forward to one day getting a new body. You don't have to worry about no sickle cell, no hemoglobin. Can you say amen? Sometimes I think about that. It makes me feel good because he made it. Because he said, Dad, I want that kind of a body. A body with no more aches, no more pains, no more burdens. Can you say amen? Amen. But God has got to fix us right. We have to fit. We have to fit that suit. And he is doing all that he can to get us ready so that when that heavenly body comes, it will be a perfect fit. And we will be smiling and speaking in tongues and shouting throughout all eternity. Isn't that something? Oh, yes. Well, where are we? I missed my place. Well, we are done with this verse. Let us now go to Zechariah chapter 6, verse 12 and 15. Zechariah chapter 6. Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And he is doing just that. Right now. Now, this is a prophecy, verses 12 through 15. Zechariah chapter 6, verse 12 through 15. This is a prophecy of God building his church using the Gentiles. See, the Jews thought that these verses were talking about them because they thought that this had reference to the Jews that were dispersed throughout the known world as they thought. So when Peter, when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, when he said, repent and be baptized in one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the mission of sins, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you, to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. He thought concerning this verse, 
Because the Jews that lived in the environs of Jerusalem were called the Jews that were near. And those Jews that lived outside of Jerusalem were called the Jews that were far off. And so when he quoted that, all that are far off, he was thinking in his mind that salvation is for those Jews that are near and those that are far off because of this. Because they preached the gospel from the Old Testament. But little did he know that 10 years later, when God saved the first Gentile to be converted to the Christian faith, as Bishop James Johnson put it, Cornelius, he realized that what he said in Acts 2, 38 and 39 was not talking about the Jews that were near. It was talking about the Gentiles that were far off. Well, let's read it. Um, verse 12. And Zechariah 6 and 12, let's read and speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. This is the prophecy of Jesus Christ. God coming as Jesus Christ to build the temple of the Lord. See, they thought it was to be a Jewish temple because only Israel would have anything to do with building a temple for Jehovah. Can we say amen? But it's not talking about that kind of a temple. It's talking about the temple of the church of God. And nobody knew that the Gentiles were to be included. And God has said that in Abraham shall all families of the earth be blessed. He said all families. But it was hidden where the Apostle Paul came from, that God intended to extend salvation to the Gentiles and take out of them the people for his name. All right? Well, he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Verse 13, even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall, he gets all the glory, is that right? And shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. He is going to be the branch. He is going to be the builder. The Bible says here he shall rule upon his throne, which means he's going to be a ruler. He's going to be a ruler and a priest, and the council of peace shall be between them both. Them both positions. Him as ruler and him as priest. Because he was the high priest forever after the order of what? Can we say amen? And so the council of peace shall be between both positions. Let's read. Well, let's jump down to verse 15. This is what we want to get to. Let's read. And they that are far off shall come and build in what? They thought it had to do with a natural temple for Jehovah. But those that are far off has to do with the Gentiles that God would bring into the church to make them in his image. And after his what? Likeness. And what is he using to build his church? Souls of men. Can you say amen? And women. You are cool too. Praise the Lord. Alright. For I shall build in the temple of the Lord, and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. This shall come to pass, and you will diligently obey the voice of who? The Lord your God. All right, well, let's look at another scripture. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2 and show you that. Read just one verse. We're almost finished for tonight. Ephesians chapter 2. They that far off shall come and build in the temple of the Lord. And that's what we're doing tonight. How is that? Well, because he was making man in his image and after his likeness. Ephesians chapter 2. And let's read verse number 11 and 12. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. All right, let's read there. Wherefore, remember that ye men in time past, what? Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called, what? For the Jews. In the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from 
from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having a hope without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometime are what? Far off are made nigh by what? There it is right there. You see, man? It's like a riot prophesying about God building another temple. A temple like no other temple. A holy temple. A holy temple. Let's jump down to verse number 19. Verse 19 through 22. Right? We're almost finished. Let's read. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but what? Fellow citizens of the saints. Now, what? We are part of the church, too. It started off as a Jewish church, but now we are what? Part of the church. And there's just one church made up of Jew and what? Gentile. Let's read. And are built upon the foundation of what? Apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the what? Chief cornerstone, and whom all the what? All the what? All the what? Beauty, fitly framed together, groweth unto a what kind of temple? Holy, Holy temple of the, in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for the habitation of God. What? He's trying to fit us in this building. Got the ads on us, cutting us away with the trials and the tests, trying to make us fit right. And if we let him do his work, when the time comes, we'll be ready to see Jesus. Can we say amen? amen. Well, let me see here. Let's go to 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. We'll read that. First Epistle of John, chapter 4, verse 17. All right. I think we're almost out of time. Verse Epistle of John, chapter 4, and verse number 17. All right. Let's read. Um, I'm in Peter, Lord, and verse number 4. I'm looking at that and saying, what in the world is that? Verse chapter 4, verse 17. Let's read. Herein is our love made complete or perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we what? In this world. The love of God is what will cause us to be like him. And we will be complete. Uh, Revelation 19 and 7. Revelation 19 and 7. God is making us in his image after his likeness. And the marriage supper of the Lamb will take place at the closing days of the tribulation period. Let's read verse number seven. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself what? ready. You say amen? amen. We got to make ourselves ready. We got to get ready to see Jesus. All you got to do is let him have his perfect work in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Lay aside any weight and send those in possession. Be obedient to God's work and be in the church. And you in. Isn't that something? Amen. Well, let's back up. Well, let me see. Let's go to chapter 17. Let's back up chapter 17, verse 14. Made herself ready. Now he's talking about the Battle of Armageddon here. We're going to come and fight the Battle of Armageddon, but then we'll put an end to man's government and set up his kingdom to close the tribulation period. But let's look at verse 14 here. These, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. That is, the nations of the world are going to try to fight against God with the Antichrist. He says, and he shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb, what? Shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords, and King of kings, and they that are with him are what? All chosen. Call to the waters of baptism in Jesus' name, and the Holy Ghost of heaven speaking other tongues. Chosen in him before the foundation of the world, and faithful unto them. Those are the ones that are going to be with him. Let's go to Daniel chapter.
chapter 7, verse 13 through 14, the last scripture. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 through 14. The subject took a little longer than we thought. Um, we're kind of reading this out of sequence, but uh, we'll make it fit what we're talking about here. Um, Daniel saw this prophecy. Daniel 7, verse 13. Uh, and I saw, I saw the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days and brought him near before him. Now, who is that one like the Son of Man? That's good you didn't answer. I thought somebody was going to say Jesus. That's the church. One like the what? We shall be like him, but we shall see him what? I thought I was going to catch him, but you're smart. You're smart. He saw the night visions, one light, and the what? Son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days. Now, the ancient is God. He got some days when he became a man. So the ancient of days is Jesus. You say amen? Jesus. All right. Uh, let me see. Brought him there before him, verse 14, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that shall, which shall not be what? Or destroyed. One like the Son of Man came to the what? Ancient of days. And that's what's going to happen when the rapture takes place. We're going to be coming to the ancient of days. We're going to be caught up. In the clouds to meet the Lord where? Yeah. In the air. And we're going to be just like him. We shall see him as he is. He said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, which is the whole purpose of God's 50,000 year plan of what he wants. Are there any questions tonight? We'll cover it in Sunday Yes, thank you. Okay, one at a time. One at a time. Uh, so angels don't have souls? No. Do not, well, angels are spirits. They are spirits. And um, they do not have soul like, uh, like we have. They are spirits. They don't, they don't have bodies. They can manifest themselves in, in all kinds of different forms, but no. Anybody have to ask another question? Um, 16, Romans 16 and 22.